ನೋಡಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಸದಸ್ಯ ನಮ್ಮ ಸದಸ್ಪತೆಯೇ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಅಗೈನ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸರ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಆಸ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಮೀ ಟು ಅಡ್ರೆಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಆಗಸ್ಟ್ ಆಡಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ವೇದ ವೈಭವಂ that is glory of vedas the glory of vedas has been understood has been appreciated by several scholars both in india and outside india if indian scholars the prachina gurus like shankara ramanuja madhva and the contemporaries now like vivekananda arbindo and others if they are extolling the glory of vedas then it is not at all surprising for us because all our sects and subsects within hinduism have one thing common we all have our roots in vedas therefore even though there are different sampradayas we are one in one thing that in claiming in acclaiming that vedas are supreme but what is surprising is that so many scholars outside india who do not come in the tradition of respecting vedas who come across vedas as just an object of study if they are attracted to vedas and if they say that vedas are supreme then there is something more in it and that is what we are going to see today and the list of admirers of vedas is a long list that list includes several eminent persons persons who have gained eminence in several walks of life from several professions and i am giving yes sub list there i am starting with professor schrodinger a great physicist a nobel laureate winner of nobel prize from austria we will learn more about the eminence of these persons later let me first go through the list now then we have m materlink from belgium who is also a receiver of nobel prize then we have henry david thoreau american philosopher then we have jean lee me a french author arthur schopenhauer a german philosopher r w emerson an american poet dr anni besant a woman speaker will durant an american historian alfred north whitehead a british mathematician f max muller 
a German philologist, Louis F. Jacoliot, a French official, Rudolf Steiner, an Austrian architect, Herman Melville, an American novelist, Ella Wheeler Wilcox, an American woman poet, Paul William Roberts, a Canadian television producer, David Frawley, an American writer, Dara Shiko, a prince when Mohammedans ruled India, H.M. Hindman, a British publicist, Sir John Woodruff, a British advocate, Paul Thiem, a German Indologist, Dick Terrasi, who lives along with us now, an American author. What do they say about Vedas? We are going to see many excerpts from different books. But I have collected some important words mentioned by them about Vedas. They say that Vedas are most ancient. They are unparalleled in literature. Vedas are sublime, vast, pure, lofty, divine, primitive, thoroughly scientific, wonderful, eternal, unfathomable, unbroken chain, astonishing, majestic, august, sacred, terrible, full of solemn anguish, condensed wit, God revealed, most advanced, essential, immortal and invaluable treasure. This is what those foreigners are saying about Vedas. Next. They are also adding, it's a great wave, it is forever valid, it is a reservoir, it is a luminary, it is solitary, it is having splendor, and it is the book that is first ever known to man. I am dividing this talk into five parts. The first part is about the antiquity of Vedas to say that Vedas are very ancient. Vedas are among the oldest books. Many researchers have struggled to find the date of Vedas. Max Muller says Vedic age is between 1200 BC and 1500 BC. Keith and MacDonald, two different researchers, have come to the same conclusion that Vedic age is between 1200 before Christ and 2000 before Christ. Whitney and some others, they say that Vedic age is before 2000 BC. Winter Nids, a German researcher, says Vedic age is between 2000 BC and 2500 BC. Jacobi says that the Vedic age is between 3000 BC and 4000 BC. Next. Satyavrata Samashrami says the Vedic saint Kasha Kritsana has lived before 5000 years and therefore Veda cannot be brought after him. Lokamanya Bala Gangadhar Tilak says that Vedic age is between 6,000 BC and 10,000 BC and his evidences are mostly astronomical. Sampurna Nanda says that the Vedic age is between 18,000 BC and 30,000 BC. Pandit Krishna Shastri Godbal concludes that Vedic age is before 18,000 BC. Avinash Chandradas Mukhopadhyaya has written a book determining the Vedic age to be between 25,000 B.C. and 50,000 B.C. Lele Shastri says that Vedic age is between 40,000 B.C. and 54,000 B.C. Rajapur Patankar Shastri says that Vedic age is approximately 21,000 B.C. and his main reason is about the floods in the Saraswati River. Next, 
Pavaki says that Vedic age is before 240,000 years. And Pandit Dinanath Shastri says Vedic age must be before 3 lakhs years. Dr. Jwala Prasad says that Vedic age should be before 5 lakhs years. And Nobel laureate Matter Link says that Vedic age is before 70 lakhs years. And Maharshi Dayananda says that the Vedic age must be before 200 crores years. And his reasoning is that Veda was there when the world was created. This is the age of the world and therefore that should be the age of the Vedas. Next. When people are giving so many different dates for Vedas, what, how do they conclude that their conclusion is the right one? I start with Max Muller. Max Muller writes, whether Vedic hymns were composed in 1000 or 1500 or 2000 or 3000 BC, no power on earth will ever determine. I have exactly quoted his words. He is only making a proposal that let it be 1200. That's all. Because it cannot be brought even below that. This is what Max Muller himself writes. Next. Same Max Muller writes, I have repeatedly dwelt on the merely hypothetical character of the dates. Merely hypothetical. Which I have ventured to assign to the first periods of Vedic literature. This he writes when some other researchers criticized Max Muller for unnecessarily bringing down without any reason the age of the Vedas among themselves. The other foreigners are criticizing him. To them he replies that this is only of a hypothetical character. I do not stand by, the side, uh, by that. I do not swerve by that. Next. A.B. Keith, who has written history of Sanskrit literature and who has published edited books on Vedas translation. Arthur Berridale Keith, 1879 to 1944, Regius Professor of Sanskrit, University of Edinburgh. He, even though he says it is 2000 BC, finally he gives up his own conclusion, says that we cannot decide. It's just a guesswork. Next. Max Muller again. In the Rig Veda, we shall have before us more real antiquity than in all the inscriptions of Egypt or Nineveh. The Veda is the oldest book in existence. Only that much we can say. Date we cannot decide. Next. Will Durant, a famous American historian, writes, Upanishads are the oldest extant philosophy and psychology of our race the surprisingly subtle and patient effort of man to understand the mind and the world. This is what Upanishad is all about. To understand the mind, that is why it is psychology. To understand the world, that is why it is philosophy. Next. This is Will Durant. He is considered by others as one of the most recognized historians of the entire world. Will Durant is famous historian. Next. What do we say? The traditional view. Traditional view is Vedas are eternal. Vedas themselves declare Vacha Virupa Nityaya Vrishne Chodasva Sushtutim. These are praises offered to God and these are Nitya. Eternal. Next. Stephen Knapp. He is so much attracted by the Vedic philosophy that he converted his name as Nanda Nandana Dasa. He's actually Stephen Knapp. Next. He says that the Vedic phil philosophy contains the oldest spiritual texts of any religion in the world. Jack Oliott, about whom I have talked in the morning also, he, he writes, in point of authenticity, the Vedas have incontestable precedence over the most ancient records. We cannot contest that at all. No historian is disagreeing with that. Next. Swami Dayananda Saraswati, he is described by others 
as a human dynamo because he violently attacked the uh, critics of vedas he wrote our vedas are earliest books deshika says prachinanam shruti parishadam they are old they are ancient next i am now coming to part 2 second part of the five parts bequeathment of vedas bequeathment means the way in which they have been transferred to posterity next this is from jean meeli the pyramids have been eroded by the desert wind the marble broken by earthquakes and the gold stolen by robbers while the veda unlike the pyramid unlike the marble unlike the gold is recited daily by an unbroken chain of generations traveling like a great wave through the living substance of the mind this is taken from that book hymns from the rigveda he was born in france in 1931 he had studied sanskrit in columbia university next this is the book from which i took that ex- excerpt that passage rigveda samhita is the title of the book next the way in which vedas were transferred as i mentioned in the morning even a single letter should not be altered several steps were taken to preserve the purity varnakshara pada bhrashtam matrasvara vivarjitam that is a separate passage another avakshara manayushyam visvaram vyadhi peeditam this is the passage given in given by panini in his shiksha grantha therefore even one varna or akshara or pada is bhrashtam then it is a sin that we have committed we have to do some prayaschitta for that and prayaschittas are also prescribed even a matra even a swara should, should not be omitted next next please graham hancock is the author of a number of best selling investigations of historical mysteries including the sign and the seal that is the name of a book fingerprints of the gods he has written a book under that title what is the most amazing about this hymnodies is not so much their overall length which is awesome but that for most of their history it is probable that no written versions of them ever existed not because they could not be written down but because they should not be written down next next please Mark and Daya Smriti says that Vedas cannot be modified even slightly. Next. Vedas should not be written, says Mahabharata. Next. 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 Another passage says that if you read Veda, Vedas... after seeing a leaf that is a book then it is not only becoming waste but it is also becoming dangerous it is not only useless it is harmful to read vedas from a book now i am going to the third part contents of the vedas this part will be completely new to you next erwin schrodinger the first name that i mentioned the great nobel laureate he writes the striving of all the scholars of vedanta was after having learned to pronounce with their lips that is also important it is not enough to learn the meanings of the vedas we learn to pronounce with the lips uchcharanam is important then after that really to assimilate in their minds this grandest of all thoughts next this is the famous erwin schrodinger and next line gives the book that he has written he was an austrian physicist 
He, in 1933, received the Nobel Prize for Physics for the formulation of the now famous Schrodinger equation. He also received the Max Planck Medal and there is an Erwin Schrodinger Prize in the Austrian Academy of Sciences. He also received Austrian decoration for science and art in 1957. He's a renowned scientist. Next, I'm going to Henry David Thoreau, 1817 to 1862, American philosopher, Unitarian social critic, transcendentalist, and writer. Next, he writes, what extracts from the Vedas I have read fall on me like the light of a higher and purer luminary, Jyotis, Tejas, which describes a loftier course through purer stratum. It rises on me like the full moon after the stars have come out, wading through some far stratum in the sky. He, he experiences the Vedic pronunciation like this. In the great teaching of the Vedas, there is no touch of sectarianism. It is of all ages, all claims, and all nationalities, and is the royal road for the attainment of the great knowledge. Next the veneration, that is the respect, in which Vedas are held is itself a remarkable feat. People are not worshipping books except the book of Vedas. Next. Friedrich Max Muller, German philologist, 1823 to 1900. Next. I maintain that for everybody who cares for himself or cares for his ancestors or who cares for his history or who cares for his own intellectual development for every such person, a study of Vedic literature is indispensable. You cannot do without it. You have to study Vedic literature if you care for intellect. Jack Oliott, he worked as a government official in French India. Next. The Hindu revelation which proclaims the slow and gradual formation of worlds, that is step by step evolution, is of all revelations the only one whose ideas are in complete harmony with modern science. No other old books are in harmony with modern science. Next. Herman Melville, 1819 to 1891, he was a great American novelist. Next, he writes, Vedas are mystical books whose perusal would seem to have been indispensable to Vishnu before beginning the creation. Vishnu used Vedas for the creation itself. And which therefore must have contained something in the shape of practical hints to young architects. It looks like a book of manuals, how to create the universe. Vishnu has to refer to Vedas. Next. Paul William Roberts. He is a was a lecturer in Oxford University. He is an award-winning television writer and producer in Canada. Next. He says the Vedas hold enough information to rebuild human civilization from scratch, if necessary. Suppose the entire civilization is lost, only Vedas remain, then he says it is possible to reconstruct this civilization. Next. Count Maurice Maeterlinck, 1862-1949, was a Belgian poet and 1911 Nobel Prize for Literature. He is commenting on Vedic hymns, is it possible to find in our human annals words more majestic, more full of solemn anguish, more august in tone, more devout, more terrible? Is it possible to find something other than Vedas which satisfy these uh, characteristics? Next. This is matter link. Next. Sir John Woodruff, another name, or the Avalon. 1865 to 1936 was a well-known scholar and he came to the East and he was an advocate general of Bangla. Next. An examination of the Vedic theses shows 
that it is in conformity with the most advanced philosophical and scientific thoughts of the West. And where this is not so, that is in places where the two do not agree, it is the scientist who will go to the Vedantist and not the Vedantist to the scientist. <laughs> Next. Paul Thiem, 1905. He's a German Indologist. He says, Vedas are noble documents, not only of value and pride to India, but to the entire humanity. Next. Dick Terassi is an American writer, present day writer. Uh, he has written after 2000. This is taken from a recent book. He says, these roots of modern science are available in India, were available in India long ago. Rigveda asserted that gravitation held the universe together and we are taught that it is Sir Isaac Newton's discovery. The Sanskrit speaking Aryans subscribed to the idea of a spherical earth in an era when the Greeks believed in a flat one and we are taught that this is discovered by Galileo. The Indians of the 5th century AD calculated the age of the earth as 4.3 billion years and the same is the modern scientist's view also. Sir James McIntosh, 1765 to 1832, is a British writer and philosopher. He also admires Vedas. The theory propounded by the Vedanta is refined, abstruse, ingenious, and beautiful theory of Upanishads. I am going to the fourth part of today's talk. divinity of the Vedas. Vedas are divine. We will say, we will agree that Vedas are divine because we are followers of Vedas. But what do people from other religions say about the divinity of Vedas? I start from Prince Muhammad Dara Shikho. He was Aurangzeb's brother. Shah Jahan's elder son. He has translated Upanishads into Persian language about which our governor was mentioning in the morning. He is the author of that translation. Prince Muhammad Dara Shikho, 1627 to 1658 AD, the favorite Sufi son of Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan. What does he say? He says about Vedas, the first heavenly book and the fountainhead of ocean of monotheism. Monotheism is particularly emphasized because there was a wrong propagation, propaganda that Vedas are polytheist works. It is not so. In his Persian translation of the Upanishads, this prince writes, after gradual research, I have come to the conclusion that long before all heavenly books, including his own heavenly book, Quran, God had revealed to the Hindus through the rishis of yore, of whom Brahma was the chief. Brahma was also a rishi in as far as he revealed Vedas. His four books of knowledge, the Rig Veda, the Yajur Veda, the Sama Veda, and the Adharva Veda. God had revealed these four books. That is what that prince writes before going to the next. I will say a few more words about that princess. These ideas of his brother Aurangzeb did not like. Aurangzeb developed hatred towards his own brother. Therefore, he convened a meeting of Islamist priests and with their concurrence, he beheaded his brother. His brother was killed because he was having such views. Now, now Hans Thorvestan, a native of Germany, now lives in Austria. Next. He has written a book, Heart of Hinduism. In that book, uh, this quote is taken from that book. To the Hindu, Shruti is what cannot be thought up by the limited human intellect, but it is of God. 
it is what is forever valid never invalid never changes is not dependent on the limited capacity for understanding of any one historical person the hindu for this reason is proud not to need a historical founder the founder and foundation of the vedas and the upanishads is the brahman itself not the brahman brahman supreme soul is what is indestructible and timeless god is the founder of this religion next this is the tight cover page of the book from which the previous quote was taken next we believe that veda is not different from god vedo narayana sakshat we equate veda to god next i'm going to the last part the fifth part of this talk there are hidden meanings in the vedas next rudolf steiner is an austrian architect next he writes what we read in the vedas those archives of hindu wisdom gives us only a faint idea of the sublime doctrines of the ancient teachers doctrines are more than the idea that we get even so these are not in their original form only the gaze of the clairvoyant directed upon the mysteries of the past may reveal the unuttered wisdom there is so much wisdom in the vedic passages which we are not able to see even if we see the passage there may reveal the unuttered wisdom which lies hidden behind these writings he believes that there are many layers of meanings to this next in fact we also traditionally believe so solange le maitre in his book on hinduism writes there is more than a purely literal meaning to be found in the vedas there should be more meanings in that next madhvacharya writes tryarthatam shrutishu vitta dashartham for vedic passages there are three layers of meanings tryarthatam and he calls them adhyatmika adhibhutika and so on but what we see is the first layer only or the ravolan writes its more advanced concepts can be difficult for even the greatest scholars of the west to fathom that is why it is unfathomable it is very gambhira next that is why deshika says gambhiranam not easy to grasp akrutaka giram not man made gahate chittavrittim its grand thought there there are other methods to grasp those grand thoughts next thank you sir i have a question sir yeah thanks for the brilliant exposition very inspiring now how do we excite the generation next about the value of the vedas kindly enlighten us these ideas to them through english language because i find the younger generation including my own grandsons they do not know our language there is a case with all uh, south indian or any dravidian language kannada people they don't know kannada telugu they don't know telugu so it is happening everywhere it's not uh, necessarily for tamil sir can i have a question please but to make your question very short we are no, we are no it's very question. common question sir as you tell it is so vast and wide and uh, so much year old and all if i want to start from where i can start even now there are many gurukuls many veda patashalas <laughs> only thing is we do not want our our youngsters to start that kind of education sir you mentioned about different periods of vedas 
and he said it's not exactly known as to when it was uh, written because there is a lot of variation. In that context, you mentioned about the books. Yeah. May I know what actually is that uh, book? I, I took extracts from many books, one from Max Muller, one from Keith, one from MacDonald, and one more which I have not shown here he is from Kajki and Wilson. Every one of them will give an age of Vedas, will make a proposal. At the end, they say it is only a Hesham conjecture. Even I would like to ask one question to all of our scholars. Uh, like how they ask from where to start. Uh, is it many youngsters feel that they we don't have anything on uh, Sanskrit literature? So I would like to ask that what kind of steps would be taken to turn their minds and show the treasure we have in Sanskrit literature? I have this question. Where do we commence? Uh, there is one easy solution for Bangaloreans. The Karnataka Sanskrit University is starting an evening course in BA in Sanskrit. So where the three core subjects are Sanskrit and that offers an excellent introduction to the study of Sanskrit and the qualification that is required is only your second, second year pre-university. And if you have some knowledge of Sanskrit in addition, it's so welcome. Even otherwise, we start from the beginning and the course is from the classes are from 5 to 8 in the evening. So Bangaloreans can make use of this opportunity. Those who are retired, those who are employed and can find time in the uh, evening hours, they are most welcome. You can uh, visit the website of Karnataka Sanskrit University and go to the evening college uh, in that um, uh, website. You will get all the details. So there you make a start with learning Sanskrit and that can lead you to the Vedas. Thank you very much.